Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another session of a, a webinar by Beating Hearts. I'm Dr. Betty Tay, and we have here with me, uh, with us, uh, Mr. P.S. Ranjan. Mr. P.S. Ranjan is a founder and, of course, um, the lawyer behind the firm, P.S. Ranjan. Um, P.S. Ranjan and I go back with a history, with a history, which we may or may not speak about it later. But... Um, let me just uh, invite him to share his uh, slides, please. And then without further ado, just carry on, please, Mr. Ranjan. All right. Thank you, Dr. Betty Tay, for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today about the subject of consent in Malaysian healthcare. And I've added the words, a jumbled picture. If you agree with me as regards various points at the end of this presentation, I would like you to answer a certain question, not necessarily allowed. And the question is, will, do you feel discontented after having heard me? We shall see. First, I would like to use this word, gatekeeper. Doctors see themselves as gatekeepers. When patients come to see them, they do not expect patients to decide what is wrong with them, the patients. They do not expect patients to decide for themselves what treatment that they need. The doctor is the gatekeeper. It is for the doctor to come to a conclusion as regards matters of diagnosis. And then for the doctor to offer treatment. So the, it, the initiative comes from the doctor to offer treatment. Sometimes there may be more than one treatment option. I remember a case some years ago in which a young unmarried woman who wanted to have a tubal ligation because she did not want to have babies. And that raised some difficult questions. It was not meant to be for medical reasons. She was in good health. A tubal ligation was intended by her for preventing her from having babies for social reasons. Now again, there, therefore you would wonder, is the doctor under a duty just to respect the request made by the patient? And certainly you know, a doctor is under no duty to provide treatment upon demand. Let me give another more definite example. There are people who think that Termination of a pregnancy may be undertaken by a doctor merely on demand by the patient when there are no medical reasons. It is not the law that a patient can demand termination of a pregnancy when there are no medical grounds. It will be a criminal offense, in fact, to undertake such a termination. Under Malaysian law, a pregnancy may be terminated if the mother's life is in such danger that the doctor has to act in good faith for the purpose of saving the life of the mother. Saving the life. That's a very exact term used. Then more recently, a further loosening of the exception. And that is where Termination of the pregnancy is the preferred alternative to continuation of the pregnancy. So you see a medical element involved. So there is a limit to a patient's right of self-determination. You know, we are in a period where people talk about human rights all the time. The right to bodily integrity, the right to exercise personal autonomy. There are limits to such a right. Now, the general principle, therefore, is this. And so, 
Sorry, we were lagging. Is it Ranjan? Is it me or is it you? To accept or reject treatment which is offered. And that is something very vital. A patient's choice. Actually, in many a case, a patient has no real choice. And in fact, in one of the leading cases on uh, uh, consent, it was said by the High Court of Australia that except in cases of emergency or necessity, any medical treatment to be undertaken by a doctor shall be preceded by the consent of the patient to such treatment. But you note these words, except in the cases of necessity or emergency. So the greater the need for an operation for certain kinds of treatment, the lighter is the doctor's duty to give advice and information to the patient in regard to choices. So much of the discussion about whether a patient was given sufficient advice and information regarding risks of treatment is really relevant where we are talking about elective treatment. I will state a legal principle in this American case, Mr. Justice Cardozo who said, every human being of adult years and sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with his own body. And a surgeon who performs an operation without the patient's consent commits an assault. So it can be a wrong in civil law, it can be a wrong in the criminal law. But note the qualification, adult years, sound mind. But who is an adult? Who is of sound mind? There can be difficult questions arising. I'm afraid it's not very simple. I know. The thinking in this country is a person is of adult years once that person has reached the age of 18 years. And therefore, that person is not an adult until the person reaches that age. Let me give you a hint of what is coming. A girl of 16 years can give lawfully consent to sexual intercourse. She does not need the consent of her guardian. But there are many who think that that same girl cannot give consent for treatment, say for a fractured ankle, unless the guardian gives consent. And that too they say, oh, the consent must be in writing. By the way, about a girl giving consent to sexual intercourse, the penal code does not require consent to be in writing when it comes to consent to sexual intercourse. But unfortunately, there are many in this country, in this world, who think that when it comes to medical treatment, consent is not valid unless it is in writing. Writing. We have oral presentations, we have oral examinations, we have oral sex, but we cannot have oral consent. I'm very, very disturbed. Let's move on. Therefore, where a patient is of unsound mind, including when being comatose or is not an adult, someone else may give consent. But really in cases of necessity or emergency, consent of another person would not be necessary. Unfortunately, I say, I say this, huh? unfortunately in this country, there, there's been many a case where there is necessity or an emergency, but the doctors feel uncomfortable about proceeding without consent. They want something, you know, a piece of paper on which a signature appears. It may be the grandmother, it may be the nephew, they think so long as somebody has signed something, they feel safe. That may be the beginning of trouble for the doctor. Very often, time is wasted seeking a consent which is not necessary. 
time is wasted seeking a consent from someone who cannot give consent. That is a relationship. I am afraid we have a jumbled picture in this country when it comes to consent. Next. So, I make this point. Proxy or substitute consent by a member of the family, including an elderly person, is of no legal value. But I come across this many times. Elderly people, even though they are of sound mind, are being treated like animals taken to the vet. That's what is happening. People think, oh, this elderly gentleman uh, has to say, undergo the implantation of a pacemaker for the heart. So the wife or wives must be consulted. They must give their consent. The son must give his consent. The son-in-law must give his consent. Whatever for? It is the patient there, sitting there, who has to make a decision. But we see this so frequently. Proxy or substitute consent frequently appears in our medical legal cases. And I say that doctors, hospital authorities are asking for trouble, unnecessary consent. There can be situations a proxy or substitute consent may be necessary. We shall see. Next. Your, your what is very laggy. Your Wi-Fi is very laggy. Mr. Ranjan, we lost you there. Mr. Ranjan. Okay, if there are any questions, please um, please raise your hand or either that or type your question into the chat. Okay. And um, oh, Mr. Ranjan is very laggy as in we have lost him completely. Okay. I, I think there is a value to what he just said. Uh, as in whether in, a nest, in an emergency, are we practicing defensive medicine by wanting a consent from just anybody? Um, possibly. I think the fact that uh, we are being sued on a regular basis, um, a lot of times we do practice defensive medicine. So let's hope. Mr. Ranjan, are you back? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Come. Defensive medicine is bad medicine. Yes. Because the focus of attention shifts from care and concern for the patient to care and concern for the doctor's interest. And that is not necessarily a good thing. Yes. So, next slide, please. So, in the thoughts of assault and battery, liability arises even without proof of damage. We have seen that. So, when we compare it with the thought of negligence, damage must be proven to have been caused by the negligence so as to establish liability. Next one, please. However, even those of unsound mind may, in certain circumstances, lawfully refuse to give consent to propose medical treatment if they continue to have sufficient mental capacity. And this is an important point that even people of unsound mind have their rights. You really think so? Have their rights? No, possibly. Again. We lost you. What is wrong with your Wi-Fi, Mr. Ranjan? Oh, people of unsound mind may, in certain circumstances, lawfully refuse to give consent. Um, again, we lost him. Okay, people of unsound mind lawfully against... Wait, 
I must read that sentence again. Let's wait for Mr. Ranjan. Mr. Ranjan, what is wrong with your Wi-Fi? No, you need to unmute. We can't hear you. We okay. have paid our bills. <laughs> you have problems paying your bills. No, we have paid our bills. <laughs> <laughs> We need to see receipt because you we are a little. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Next, all right. So let us look at this case in Britain. 68-year-old prisoner, paranoid schizophrenia, diabetes. So he had a gangrenous leg. He refused to undergo amputation. Now it was a condition unrelated to his mental condition. Now his mental condition could lawfully be treated without his consent because he was a mental patient. But could his leg be amputated without his consent? Because it was not a psychiatrist who was going to undertake the amputation. He refused. So the health authority applied for an order of the court. The judge heard evidence from the patient, from the doctors, and he heard legal arguments. Next slide. Thank you. The court decided that he had sufficient mental capacity to withhold consent to the operation. He said he wanted to die a complete person. That is meaningful. Right? So the operation could not proceed. It is oversimplistic. This is a psychiatric patient. Therefore, we... Mr. Ranjan. Your Wi-Fi, can you do something about your internet? Your talk is extremely interesting, but we keep having to stop. Oh. oh my God. Okay, go on. Your internet is not of sound mind. <laughs> <laughs> Failure of technology. <laughs> okay, go on. Right. So let's look at advanced medical directives, huh? living wills. Basically, a living will as opposed to an ordinary will is like this. The person says something is to be done to that person or for that benefit of that person while that person is alive. Whereas in an ordinary will, what the person says is something is to be done after that person's death. So. Uh, that's a vital distinction. Now, so, patient ceases to have mental capacity, say. For instance, say, a dementia, say. But then even patients with dementia may be able to make decisions. Patient may be in a comatose condition. Now, while of sound mind, that means the patient gives directions in advance regarding what treatment or procedures may be undertaken or refused upon the patient losing mental capacity. And the patient may delegate decision-making to another person, for instance, a member of the family. Okay, can I stop you here? If the patient is not of sound mind, okay, or losing his mental capacity, can he actually delegate? Is this delegation valid? Now, if the patient does not have sufficient mental capacity, then the patient cannot make a living will. But if the patient has got sufficient mental capacity, then the patient can make a living will. That is the vital point. And in fact, when it comes to ordinary wills, very often the dispute in court would be whether the patient had mental capacity when making the will. We have seen that often enough. By the way, advanced medical directives have made their appearance in Malaysia already. We don't need a judgment of the court or an act of parliament, though in Singapore they introduced an act of parliament, because an advanced medical directive is made while the person is of sound mind, stating his or her intentions to the doctor. So it will be helpful to have in the opening words of an advanced medical directive to my lawyer, to my doctor, to my pastor, to my wife, etc. That's important. 
So one of these days, a doctor will may see a living will brought in by a patient. And who will actually look into this? Who will actually exercise this will, living will? A lawyer? Exercise a living will. It is the person making the will who makes his or her wishes known. All right. I think getting a lawyer to assist in the preparation of a living will would be helpful. Would be helpful. And I think getting medical advice would also be helpful. Now, you would have heard of Jehovah's Witnesses stating in advance their wishes. So, uh, before I deal with this slide. I'll give you two examples of Jehovah's Witnesses stating the wishes in advance. There's a famous case in Canada where a young woman carried on her person a card which stated that she was a Jehovah's Witness who will not accept a blood transfusion. She was an adult. She was of sound mind. Her wishes were noted on that card. She became unconscious following a motor vehicle accident. But the card spoke for her. The doctors saw the card, but ignored her wishes and gave her a life-saving blood transfusion. Upon recovering from the accident, she sued them and succeeded. Because the doctors did not respect her wishes. It was, in fact, a basic form of advanced medical direction. A more dramatic case in the UK where a woman was injured by an intruder in her home. She was taken to a hospital, bleeding heavily. She was advised that she needed a life-saving blood transfusion. She refused. She bled to death. That intruder was charged for killing her. His defense was her refusal to accept the blood transfusion was unreasonable. The judges refused to accept that argument. That her refusal was reasonable, but he could not escape because of her refusal. You're still guilty of an offense. So let us look at this question. If there's a... Okay. ...ever been discussed in this country. How... Mr. Ranjan. Somebody is trying to sabotage this. <laughs> Conspiracy theory will only bring you to us speculating that you are not of sound mind, Mr. Ranjan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now. So. If it happens right. again, okay. I will believe you. Is next one, please. Okay. All right. Next. Let's look at the next. So, in certain situations, consent may be given lawfully by a mentally disordered person. Please keep that in mind. Parliament has said that a mentally disordered person can give consent to men. <laughs> we have a suburb. doctors and lawyers know. Do doctors and lawyers know that point? Enough about them. <laughs> this is um, like watching, um, you know, the silent movie. Okay. Now, by default, by two psychiatrists, one of whom must be the attending psychiatrist. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Next one, please. Okay, okay can we wait, wait? Can we just go back there and let me have a look at what? Because we missed some of the words that you said. Consent, mentally disordered person. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're still missing it. It's happening again. By a guardian of a minor or a relative, an adult. It cannot give consent. It can be so in a number of cases. By default, two psychiatrists of whom one must be the attending psychiatrist. Next, all right. In emergencies, for, uh, I'm talking about mentally uh, incapacitated people. Uh, 
emergency is consent for surgery or electroconvulsive therapy may be given by the guardian or a relative or by default by two doctors. No consent is required for other forms of conventional treatment. The trouble is doctors are so frightened of lawyers, they think they need to have something in writing. Something in writing, somebody has signed, oh, then they feel safe. Many years ago, I had a case of a lady who gave consent for the implantation of a cardiac pacemaker. Then she withdrew the consent. Mind you, she withdrew the consent. The son told the cardiologist, I will sign the consent form. The cardiologist was so happy. Yes. So the son signed the consent form. Like as though, you know, his mother was a dog, you know, taken to the vet. What happened? The, I don't know what the lady understood. She went in for the procedure. The pacemaker was implanted successfully. On the date of discharge, she collapsed and died from an unrelated condition. Unrelated, I say. Nothing to do with the pacemaker. But when the case came to me, I said to myself, the cardiologist was in trouble. Taking consent, proxy consent, substitute consent, when the lady had already said no. So my point is, there is no magic in a consent form. In fact, very often consent forms are the beginning of trouble. So let us look at this more dramatic example. The UK unlawful caesarean section, adult patient of sound mind. So she refused emergency caesarean section for saving her life and the life of her unborn baby. So uh, she opposed it in the high court. Male judge decided against her. Post operation, after the operation, she still wanted to fight. She went to the court of appeal where the doctors were confronted by two lady judges and a male judge. Appeal allowed. Her refusal was lawful. What did the court of appeal say? That a trespass had been committed against the mother. Condemned the health authority for misusing mental health law. They were saying that the mother was unsound mind. She, uh, so, you know, they had misused mental health law because if the patient was not of sound mind, they could proceed. So look at that dramatic example. But can the I stop right... you here? What was the reason behind the need for caesarean section in this lady? Fetal distress. The life of the baby was... Uh, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. Not fetal distress. It was a long-standing medical problem that the mother had. She was pregnant. She was coming to the last stages of pregnancy. The doctors decided that a caesarean section was necessary. Right? So there were sound medical reasons, but the patient can refuse. It may sound irrational, but you know, ordinary people, reasonable people are entitled to think unreasonably, to decide unreasonably. We all do that every day, you know, choosing the wrong person to get married to. Choosing the wrong Please kind don't of... Don't talk about me here, Mr. Ranjan. No. <laughs> we always say the reasonable woman, you know, controls the world. That's gone. So, look at this. 14-year-old boy refused to undergo surgery. Cleft palate and hair lip. Think about that. Right? Jehovah's Witness. Parents and doctors were in conflict. The child needed a blood transfusion. In law, the wishes of the parent are secondary. The primary concern should be the welfare of the child. Now, the American Supreme Court once made this point. You know, parents are entitled to make martyrs of themselves, but it does not necessarily follow that they may make martyrs of them of their children. And that's a very vital point to keep in mind. Right? Let's look at the famous case of Gilling. 
uh, very wordy pieces. Yeah? House of Norms, three to two verdict, government circular. Doctors may provide contraceptive advice and treatment to girls under 16 years of age without the consent of the girl's parents and guardians. It was held to be lawful, but there was a proviso. The girl's consent must have sufficient understanding and intelligence so as to give consent. And that is a matter to be decided by the doctors. But first of all, this was not meant as a license to give consent, uh, to give contraceptive advice and treatment to underage girls. Not a license, but what if the girl has got sufficient understanding and intelligence? Is she going to get into unprotected sexual intercourse? Is she going to become a young teenage mother? Will she have unstable relationships with people as a result? All these things have to be considered. Maybe contraceptive advice and treatment is the answer, but not in every case, please. Now, where the child has not attained sufficient understanding and intelligence, the rights of parents and guardians to decide remain. Save in exceptional circumstances. Again, emergency. Parents and guardians cannot be found in time. The child has been abandoned. Again, though, you know, I see this doctor saying, can somebody sign? Next one, please. So, Gillick is a vital case in the UK. So all sorts of developments after that, complex mass of statutory provisions and precedents became very complicated. The second bullet point, in some cases, consent taken from minor children and persons of unsound mind was held to be lawful. In other cases, held not to be lawful. This will tell you that these cases are fact sensitive. You have to look at the circumstances of each case. Then, in some cases, a two key approach, either parent or child may lawfully give consent. But there have been cases of refusal by mature minors of life-saving treatment being rejected by the courts, the courts intervening. Now, in Malaysia, what is the position? Gillick has not been accepted. The position of the mature minor is not recognized not yet anyway, in Malaysian law. Should it be recognized? Let's look at the next one. We have got this Guardianship or Infants Act. The guardian of the person of an infant, look at the second line, responsible, third line, health. What does responsibility for health mean? Does it extend to making decisions? What does responsibility for education mean? Does it mean that you, as the mother, say, of a 17-year-old boy, decide for the boy whether he can play football, whether he can study mathematics, or go for ballet lessons? Can you decide? Or is it just merely limited to this? Parents have to provide. It is for the children to decide if they are mature enough. Let's look at the next one. So the guardianship infant sex says, infant is a person who has not attained majority. Seems meaningless, right? Muslim, age of majority is 18 years. Non-Muslims, 21 years. So what if, say, it is argued that this act provides, therefore, that parents being responsible in the case of non-Muslims in regard to the health of their children have the right to decide until such children reach the age of 21 years. Incidentally, in Singapore, the age of majority is 21 years. In Malaysia, next one, please. the age of majority is 18. And it's even lower when it comes to things like A, marriage, B, religion, because children under 18 can get married in Malaysia in certain circumstances. Next slide. So, the Guardianship of Infants Act may prevail over the Age of Majority Act. That's a big concern. There was a professor of law in this country who told me that in her view, the Gillick case in the UK about mature minors cannot apply in Malaysia because of this act. 
the guardianship of infant side. Next slide, please. So, it is the age of majority, the age of consent. We have all been told, right, by lawyers, by senior doctors, that the age of consent is 18 years, right? Let us look at other provisions. The penal code, I've said the age of consent for a girl to sexual intercourse is 16 years. Mind you, it's even lower. Sexual intercourse by a man with his wife, by a valid marriage, whatever her age is not rape, even without her consent. Uh, so marital rape is not recognized as an offense in this country. But if the age of consent for a girl to sexual intercourse is 16 years, can we say the age of consent to medical treatment must be 18 years or 21 years? Next one. Penal code. The age of full criminal responsibility is 12 years. A child above the age of 10 years and under the age of 12 years can be found guilty of an offense if he or she has, quote, attained sufficient maturity or understanding. These are the kind of words used in the Gillick case in the UK. Again, there in court, of course, it is for the judge to form a conclusion as to whether the child has got sufficient maturity or understanding. The judge may hear factual evidence. The judge may hear expert evidence. The judge has to come to a conclusion. But if the age of criminal responsibility can be as low as 10 years, can we say the age of consent to medical treatment is 18 years or 21 years? And mind you, this penal code is the highest kind of law in the circumstances here. It's an act of parliament. Wise people in parliament have made this law. Wise people. <laughs> Sorry, I need to laugh. <laughs> so, age of consent in healthcare, public sector establishments, there's no legislation. Private sector, 18 years because the minister made this inferior legislation. I use the more polite term here, subsidiary legislation but inferior legislation is also an accepted term. The minister is subordinate to parliament. And this minister decided that age of consent shall be 18 years. Did he look at the penal code? But then he was a doctor, you know, that minister who made these regulations, but advised by a bunch of lawyers, please. So I blame the lawyers. Did they look at the penal code? Did they look at the Guardianship of Infants Act? Let me come to this. It looks like the age of consent in the penal code is as low as 12 years. Let's go on, please. But uh, I'll come to the Child Act first uh, before I come to the penal code. This act doesn't apply to every child, uh, only to a handful of children in this country. Children who need to be protected. Can you see in the middle one? Uh, protecting children. So there are provisions regarding medical examination and treatment. So only in a handful of cases. Next one, please. So children come under the act only when there's a need to provide for their care, protection, or rehabilitation. Child means a person under the age of 18 years. Ah, and then this word, authorize. Protector or police officer may authorize medical treatment. A protector usually is a welfare officer. It can be an officer of the court too if appointed by the court. Now, there are some provisions for seeking consent of parent or guardian or for proceeding without their consent even. But can a mature minor lawfully refuse to give consent to treatment or a procedure authorized by a protector or a police officer? Now, I ask you to keep in mind this word authorized. Authorized doesn't mean give consent. I remember once on a flight, I was with my wife who's an anesthetist. And there was a medical emergency on board. So my wife and another doctor had to attend to that passenger. The passenger consented to the treatment, but the pilot as captain of the flight had to give authorization under the law because he could decide that no emergency procedure should be undertaken on the aircraft. He could decide 
that you will land maybe at the nearest airport, maybe in Yangon or Lhasa in Tibet or something. He didn't. He decided to authorize it. But as I've said, authorize is a term used in the Child Act, is also used in the law regarding cadaveric organ donations. The person pledges his or her organ, liver or kidney or whatever, to be used after his or her death. The person in lawful possession of the body may authorize the removal of the organ. Pledge, authorization. So this is what is in the Child Act. Let's move on. Yes. Now, so there's protection in law for the protector, the police officer, or a doctor under the Child Act. Next one, please. So to sum up, growing recognition of the rights of mature minors, but much depends on the facts because uh, they are fact sensitive in these cases. The courts are slow to support parental consent over the objections of a mature minor, especially when the medical need for the intended treatment or procedure is not present in sufficient terms. Next one, please. So I have this question, female genital mutilation. Is that a matter of need? Circumcision because of religious edicts in the Jews, the Muslims require it. But say for cosmetic treatment, can a minor child decide? Difficult questions can arise. Next one, please. So, so I mentioned about the regulations made by this doctor who was the minister concerned. Where the patient is physically or mentally disabled, I deliberately copied it direct. Huh? Originally, that's how the word was, disabled. Somebody decided to do some editorial change and put a D at the end. Actually, Malaysians have a lot of this difficulty with the ends of words. You know? They tend to drop the ends of words. Please note the next time when a Malaysian says, ask, the letter K disappears and sounds like something else. <laughs> so, this thing, uh, spouse, parent, or next of kin, Consent is a medical exercise, a mental exercise. What does physical disability have to do with it? You lose two or three toes, you are considered a disabled person according to the welfare department. So what? Somebody else is to give consent? And they say the consent must be in writing. Why? Many things can be said orally. Next one. So we have a set of legal rules for the private sector, but not for the public sector. Why? Look at how jumbled the picture is. Private hospitals say next to a public hospital and different rules apply. Why? Next slide. So the penal code on consent, a much neglected part of the law, introduced 160 years ago. Yes, 160 years ago in India. And we have borrowed it here. Next slide, please. The defense of necessity and mentioned necessity, section 81. Nothing is an offense. Second and third lines, likely to cause harm, good faith, without any criminal intention, good faith for the purpose of preventing or avoiding other harm to person or property. Necessity. Have the doctors been advised on this point about necessity? Next one, please. Section 88, act not intended to cause death, done by consent in good faith for the benefit of a person is not an offense. So, assisted suicide is a criminal offense in this country because a person cannot give consent to being killed. Next slide, please. Section 88, A, a surgeon knowing that a particular operation is likely to cause the death of Z, who suffers under a painful complaint, but not intending to cause Z's death and intending in good faith Z's benefit, performs that operation on Z with Z's consent. A has committed no offense. Next one. A material part of section 89. What is the age of consent? Nothing which is done in good faith 
for the benefit of a person under 12 years of age, etc. By or by consent, either expressed or implied of the guardian or other person, etc., shall be an offense. So the cutoff age is given as 12 years. Implying it's only in the case of a child under 12 that consent by the parent or guardian becomes an important point. So is the cutoff age 12 years then? Next one, please. So, A in good faith for his child's benefit without his child's consent has his child cut for the stone, etc. So, A is within the exception in as much as his object was the cure of the child. No offense. Translation, no offense. Consent is given by the parent. I presume that under section 89, it is in regard to a child under 12, which suggests that in law, in regard to a child who is 12 years and above, that the wishes of the child should be taken into account. Next one, please. So, a consent is not a subject. Consent as is intended, etc. See, unless the contrary appears from the context, if the consent is given by a person who is under 12 years of age. So it looks like there's a cutoff age. Under 12, consent given by such a person will be of no effect under the penal code. Next one, please. So where the child is 12 years of age and above and under 18 years of age, what is the position? We have got these regulations made by the minister for the private sector. Age of consent is 18 years. Was the minister advised on matters like the penal code and the guardianship of infants act? Next one, please. So, an act is lawful if done in good faith for the benefit of a person without consent. If it is impossible for that person to give consent, maybe of some unsound mind, is unconscious say. If that person is incapable of giving consent, and has no guardian or other person from whom it is possible to obtain consent in time. So I have made a footnote there. This is for an emergency. Next one. Look at the illustrations. Illustration A. Z is thrown from his horse. Insensible. Surgeon finds Z requires to be trepanned. Next line. Good faith. Performs a trepanned before Z recovers. A has committed no offense. See how helpful the penal code is to the doctors. And they all worry, you know, what is a lawyer telling me? Oh, there must be something in writing. See, surgeon sees a child suffer an accident, likely to prove fatal. Operation must be performed immediately. No time to apply to the child's guardian. A performs the operation. A has committed no offense. Why wait for a consent which is unnecessary? But it goes on every day, I tell you, in the hospitals in this country. Doctors feel comfortable, feel safe when they have someone signing the consent form. Never mind whether the consent is valid or not. They feel comfortable. If it is in writing, if there's a signature, they feel comfortable. It may be the start of trouble. For the doctor. Next one. Miscarriage. Illegally, without the consent of the woman, even heavier punishment than the usual maximum. But I put it the other way around. Eh? A woman cannot come and ask for a termination of a pregnancy against the law. Next one, please. Other situations where examination, procedures, or treatment may be provided without consent. Mental patients, for their mental conditions, please. Eh? Remember the English case of Rees C, 68-year-old prisoner? Amputation of his leg was not within the scope of mental treatment. For drug addicts, because of an order of the court, they may be treated, sir. Next one, please. So, glaring example of ignoring the law on consent. Living donor organ transplants are being performed unlawfully in Malaysia 
I've been saying it for years. Nobody listened to me. Next one. I'll start with this. Why I say living donor organ transplants are illegal. The words grievous hurt in the penal code. Privation of any member or joint. Next one. It is an offense to remove an organ or part of an organ, quote, for any purpose other than the preventing of death or grievous hurt or the curing of any grievous disease or infirmity. Translation, if you are going to remove a diseased kidney, you can go ahead, it won't be an offense. But if it's a healthy kidney, you remove it so that you can transplant it into someone who needs a kidney from a living donor, you have committed a criminal offense. Next slide. So a person cannot consent to suffering death or grievous hurt. Therefore, a living will cannot lawfully include a request for euthanasia or assisted suicide. By the way, I have some criticism of mixing up terms like euthanasia and assisted suicide. In assisted suicide, the patient wants to die and makes a request for somebody to assist the patient. You, in euthanasia, the patient has not made such a request. It is the doctors who take matters into their own hands and decide that they should put an end to the life of the patient. In Under Malaysian law, both are criminal offenses. Next one. So, therefore, a living donor cannot lawfully suffer the grievous hurt of donating, for example, a kidney or part of a liver, even to a relation. Next one. Exception regarding grievous hurt. You can remove, say, a diseased organ, as I've said, for his or her own benefit. For example, to remove a disease. Now, when you say own benefit, so someone who sells his or her kidney may get some money out of it, say, that is not regarded as benefit under the penal code. It's a criminal offense to sell your kidney. Next one. So the penal <coughs> lies in the way of living donor organ transplant. That is why in India and Singapore, they introduced legislation so as to make living donor organ transplants lawful. But I said, repeat myself. I've been saying it over and over again. Nobody has listened to me. Next one. Cadaveric organ transplants, the Human Tissues Act. I'm afraid that act is very much outdated. Hmm? So when life is extinct, the body part may be lawfully removed. Uh, there's provision for consent, unclaimed bodies, etc. Next one, please. So a request by the intending donor is insufficient. That person in lawful possession has to organ authorize compliance with the request. Next one. Coming to consent in medical negligence law. The Bolan test do apply to all aspects of medical practice. Now it applies only to diagnosis and treatment. When it comes to advice and information, Advice and information must be given according to what a reasonable person in the position of the patient or the particular patient would want to know. So, um, so it's become a patient standard in regard to consent. Now, actually about, uh, too much has been said about consent in this country, I feel in medical next coming to post-mortem examinations. There's a common misunderstanding. Concern from the next of kin of the deceased is required. They all think that. Next slide. Actually, it is for the police, the public prosecutor or his officers, or a magistrate to order a post-mortem examination. The penal criminal procedure code does not give to the next of kin the right to veto or to order a post-mortem examination. Next one. 
I'm coming to summing up now. Proxy or substitute consent. Unlawful. Exceptions are where there's an advanced medical directive or a living will which is to apply. When the patient has lost mental capacity. There are just too many examples of proxy or substitute consent in this country. What is the age of consent for minors? 12 years, 18 years, 21 years. Please think about it. What is the position of guilty competent minors or mature minors in Malaysia? Non-existent. In the penal code, oral consent is still valid consent. Must consent be in writing? No. Next one, please. At common law, hmm, consent may be implied or given expressly. It can be expressly in oral form or written form. Consent forms and their contents can be a dangerous weapon. Because you know why? Sometimes consent forms are not well drafted, contain errors and omissions, contain discrepancies. Sometimes the wrong person has signed it. Sometimes the consent form is unnecessary and time had been wasted in seeking a consent while the patient is in dire need of early treatment. Then cadaveric organ donations, request followed by authorizations necessary. Next one. So living donor organ transplants are illegal, a crime. Why do doctors keep writing? Consent for post-mortem refused by family. You think they're being very clever, you know, they write that, that it saves them. But unfortunately, there is a judgment of the court of appeal in which it was mentioned that the family had acted wrongly in refusing to give consent to a post-mortem, when in the first place, it was not for the family to stand in the way. By the way, that judgment of the court of appeal was issued even though arguments had been put in writing and attempted to be put orally. I emphasize the words, huh? attempted to be put orally. And yet the court of appeal said that family members have some kind of power to order a postmortem or to veto one. I regret to say that is a wrong statement of the law. But you know what? There will always be wrong decisions. Judges, uh, I think, recognize that decisions can sometimes be challenged because they are wrong. Now, next one, please. So a review of the law is necessary. I now yes, come to this question. You do not have to answer that question. Are you feeling discontented? Next one. Thank you. Betty is muted. Oh, Betty, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Okay, very, very enlightening and very different from what I expected. Um, I have to say, open my eyes to many things. Okay, so there is, okay, I'm not sure if there will be any question, but if there is, please, okay, start to come in. Um, Dr. Subashini asked, uh, she said, good day, Mr. Ranjan. By means of sufficient mental capacity in this context to give AMD or delegating to family members, do you think need a supporting assessment by PA physician or psychiatrist, patient's physician or psychiatrist? Certainly medical evidence is helpful, but sometimes judges have complained that the medical evidence has not been helpful. No, that's how I'll put it. You sound like a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you an answer which is unhelpful. Yes, that's right. <laughs> but I'll tell you this, you know. Uh, um, well, judges, of course, you know, would welcome uh, evidence on matters which are outside the realm of ordinary human knowledge. 
whether a person has got mental capacity or not would require factual evidence and also expert evidence in many a case. So a judge may want to hear the patient giving evidence in court that the judge form his conclusions. That is vital. Okay, Lao Ching Yong, um, is there any good Samaritan law available in Malaysian, Malaysia context? Uh, I know what is meant by good Samaritan law, that if you are a good Samaritan and you kill or maim a patient because you're acting in good faith, you're protected? Is that what you mean? Well, if that is what you mean, there's no such law. If you're doing a favor, do it properly. If you're rescuing somebody, do it properly. Because you owe a duty of care when you exercise the skills of your profession. So acting in good faith because you're a good Samaritan doesn't take you very far. And I think it shouldn't take you very far. Okay. I want to ask, leaving will, what should be in this will? What? Yes, I mean, it sounds like um, very abstract to me. Okay, it, I mean, of course, it's very individualized, but a, like a person who dies and leaves a will, okay, uh, we know that it is about assets and money division. But a living will, okay, what and should be in the living will for each and every one of us. Okay, right. let's just take a Jehovah Witness. It's just about blood transfusion. But how about the rest of us? Well, but we frequently express our wishes. Right? Yes. Uh, or not. Uh, or not. Most people don't even know what they wish for. Sometimes people have to be careful about what they wish for. Yes, like me. Okay. <laughs> right. Now, sadly, I have seen this frequently at the end of life, people's wishes not being respected. That I find sad. Right now, so about what should be in a living will, eh? I suppose the identity of the patient should be clear. If the patient is going to delegate decision making to a specific person, that person should be identified clearly enough. I see. Okay. Then also this, the patient may say, when I am insensate, not able to make a decision, Please do not undertake treatment which is futile. Futile, say. The doctrine of futility is well known. So then you may want to give examples of what kind of treatment you don't want. Okay. So I think it's very important when deciding what to put into a living will to consult doctor, to consult lawyer, and sometimes family members too. There's a question here. Sorry, don't understand your statement about living donor organ transplant. Well, I have said if you remove a part of a liver or a kidney from a living person, it is grievous hurt. And under the penal code, you cannot consent to grievous hurt being committed upon you. If you cannot consent to grievous hurt being committed upon you, how on earth then can you give your kidney or part of your liver to another person? So how on earth are we going to change this? Well, in India and in Singapore, they did it. All right? Please keep that in mind. They did that in Singapore. They did that in India because they recognized the problems that arose from the penal code. It was introduced in 1861 at a time when living donor organ transplants were not a reality, I think. Okay. So basically what you're trying to say is we need to God, change the law. Due to Adam, huh? God removed a rip from Adam, committed grievous hurt, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, that's a bit offensive. I'm not a, okay. a Christian, but then. All right. So grievous hurt. So if God can commit grievous hurt, <laughs> of course you can argue it that way, right? Yes, so of course. Final thought, uh, in Dr. Muhammad Abdullah, uh, the point is that you cannot consent to Muhammad Yusuf Abdullah, right? You cannot consent to grievous hurt being committed upon you. You cannot consent to being killed. That is why in Singapore and in the UK, Australia, uh, sorry, in Singapore and India, they got around the penal code difficulty. So you are saying we need to change the law and the act? No, no, no. You can ignore the penal code. Come up with an act of parliament which excludes the application of the penal code. I see. Would a case of do not resuscitate be under living will? No. Living will is by the uh, something said by the patient. Whereas do not resuscitate may be an order given by the doctor. But you know what the patient can do is say in the living will, when I have come into such a condition and it is futile to keep my life going, please do not resuscitate me. Uh, I think that's what she meant. I yeah. see. Right. Yes. By the way, there have been cases in England, huh? do not resuscitate orders made by doctors were found to be lawful in court. Okay, Dr. Subashini said... Shocking. Shocking knowledge, especially by the legislature. Uh, may I know? Especially may I know where you're doing your master's in medical law? Hmm? May I know where you're studying I think uh, uh, Taylor's University. Taylor's University yeah. offers medical law. Uh, so does UITM. But as usual, UITM only allows um, Bhumiputra. So for Subashini and some of us, we only can go to Taylor's University. Well, you can go to other countries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. The University of Edinburgh uh, is famous. Mason and McCall Smith. Right? It has gone through many editions. Mason and uh, they started in Edinburgh University is one of the foremost centers in the world for medical law. Far in advance of what our understanding in Malaysia is. By the way, McCall Smith went on to greater things later. He wrote children's books. He wrote detective novels. He's famous for his novel on and all women detective ag agency somewhere in Africa. Oh, I see. I used to read that book. Oh, my God. And the books always have a colorful... Yes, uh, characters. Characters. No, not only colorful characters. The, the cover. Oh, cover. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. A lawyer, you know? A lawyer. <laughs> I don't know why he must point his finger and say a lawyer, you know. Uh, Dr. Subhashini, my suggestion is you take up then with your professors. I suppose as a professor of medical law in uh, Taylor's University, take up these points with your professors then. Okay, it's, I am truly enjoyed this session. It is um, very, very different from what I've gone. Do um, you feel discontented? Okay, do I feel discontented? I'm, 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 I'm not giving you clear answers, right? Yes, that's right. So that's why I'm going to say, um, on what? okay, she has mentioned something. Her on shared decision, decision is on shared decision making. Yeah. Shared decision making. Shared decision making. Who is sharing these decisions? Oh, yes. Doctor, surely you have heard in Malaysia, many people come into this, you know, decision making process. They are interfering, they are trespassing, they are causing a nuisance. <laughs> they are disrupting medical care. I'm getting fed up. You know, I'm trying to become a stand up comedian, you know, and you're 
you know, you create so many medical legal problems. I can't leave <laughs> the field of medical law. But my wife wants me, you know, huh, you want to become a stand-up comedian? What if the audience doesn't laugh, she said. Uh, possible, possible. I don't know whether she's tuned in, you know, to this one. She's okay. Amazing. So now, are we disturbed by what you have told us? Are we, well, first, whether we are disturbed or not, for one thing for sure, it has stirred something in us. It has stirred something in us. It's opened up our eyes and made us think. So I think we need another session. Oh. <laughs> Is it going to be just a few question more sessions. Yes. Um, Will it be just question and answer? Yeah, so I think um, we have never put so much thought into what you, uh, you know, but I think you are right about the fact that we do practice a lot of defensive medicine when we try to get consent from a family member, even though it means, um, you know, um, how you call it, it means at the disadvantage of the patient and his life. Okay, Dr. Ang said, don't simply take consent. Okay, that is also another thing. That I, you would have noticed from my presentation that very often taking consent is not necessary. 50 years ago, I encountered a case not too far from where I am sitting. A schoolgirl of 14 years ran out of her school into the path of a minibus. She suffered severe head injuries. She was taken to a hospital nearby. And the doctors needed to undertake surgery on her head because she had suffered severe head injuries. They waited for her father to come back from Kuala Terengganu for him to sign a consent form. She died. And I kept thinking. They waited for a consent which was not necessary. It was a fig leaf. It was, they thought, something that would protect them. In my opinion, their decision to wait for an unnecessary consent was an act of negligence. I think I'm being provocative, but I cannot think of any other conclusion. In their anxiety to Avoid a medical legal problem, I think they created one. But at that time, I'm younger than you think, you know, I just barely finished school. <laughs> I was and I can vouch for it. He's not as old as you think. <laughs> ah, so. I don't know how whether you want to take it as a compliment. Uh, okay. <laughs> but I really think, um, okay, Mr. Ang, uh, Dr. Ang says, don't simply take consent. Again, uh, I think it is very important in 80 to 90% of the cases to actually take a very good consent. Oh, somebody asked, what about implied consent? It's well, in sexual intercourse, very often it's implied consent, right? Who gives express consent? Huh? We take <laughs> consent. <laughs> In an important matter like sexual intercourse, implied consent is accepted under the penal code. So in medical law, it is also recognized. There was a famous case in America. A woman was getting off a ship as an immigrant, right? Had to undergo vaccination. And she offered her arm for the vaccination. I can't remember vaccination against what. And later on, she alleged that she had not given consent because she had not signed a consent form. The court dismissed her objection because it was implied consent. I am frustrated. Lawyers are a problem, I'm sorry to say. They think. Consent to be valid must be in writing. Okay, there's a question from Facebook. 
Uh, why can consent in emergency cases be given verbally and documented somewhere? Okay, it's, it's also a valid point where we call uh, up the tech. In an emergency from whom? Emergency. So for in emergencies, if the in an emergency, if the patient is of sound mind, able to communicate the wishes, like in the UK case, you know, the pregnant lady who refused to give consent to an emergency cesarean section, then you respect her wishes. But if she's unable to give consent in an emergency, and you don't know what her wishes are because she has not given an advanced medical directive then you proceed without consent. The substitute consent and proxy consent is very often invalid. Okay, coming back to this consent thing, two doctors, for example, we take the case of this pregnant lady who needed cesarean section, emergency cesarean section. You can have Dr. A taking the consent and the Dr. B taking the consent. And the patient may may consent to Dr. B after explanation and not to Dr. A. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Serial consent. I mean, serial, I mean. No, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to say is, okay, what I'm trying to say is some doctors are not able to get the message of how important the surgery is to the patient. Okay. Yes. Some doctors are just not, not able to do that. Well, I'm sure you have come across enough examples of doctors not being able to communicate well enough with their patients, right? Yes. Yes. Yes, we see that frequently enough in our work. All the time, I'm sure. Yes, we see it. Okay. I have want to ask one case somebody I know, okay. Now this patient was actually, has consented to do an angiogram and an angioplasty. Okay. So consented, sent down, sent to cath lab. Then he refused. He refused to cooperate. He refused. And then he wanted to come get out of the, the table, okay. And then they sent him up again to the ward. And then on a later time in the afternoon, they sent him again to the cath lab. And he again refused. Okay. Now this refusal was not documented on writing, but the consent has been taken. Following which he was sedated. Okay, he was sedated and they proceeded to do the angiogram. Did he know why they were going to sedate him or he didn't even know that? So I, that I don't know, but he eventually died. Ah, so no wonder he refused. He withdrew <laughs> his consent. <laughs> yes, but the fact is that, okay, so the, the refusal was not on, in writing, but the consent was in writing. Well, the point is, people are entitled to withdraw consent. Now, I come to this, huh? just because the consent was given in writing, doesn't mean that the patient has to withdraw consent also in writing. I see. Because my point is, all right, a woman gives consent to sexual intercourse in writing. On the next occasion, she refuses verbally. Is a man going to say, you know, you gave that consent in writing, it is supposed to last for one year? Can we just uh, use a marriage certificate instead of this um, <laughs> example of sexual intercourse? <laughs> Very often, sex takes place outside of marriage, by the way. <laughs> now, by the way, judges don't understand that point sometimes, you know. There are at least two cases in England of judges huh, who were voted huh, by the editors of a certain book as being the most ignorant judges. <laughs> One was where a young woman said, after a motor vehicle accident, she could not become a playboy bunny. She said, sadly, in court, I don't have boobs anymore. The judge looked up and asked, what's that? She didn't know what boobs were. 
You see how little he knew. You're 60 years old, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male judge. And another one, 60 year old judge too, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male judge. Young man said, after my motor vehicle accident, I could not have sex anymore. The judge said, you're not married. How can you have sex? <laughs> you see? Okay, I think uh, our Malaysian judges know, did not, our uh, know more, you know. I think the, Mr. Ranjan did not in his, um, when he said Anglo-Saxon, he didn't mean it in a racial kind of way. Okay. I'm being racist, please. <laughs> I will not make apologies. I'm fed up of people being too nice. <laughs> okay, this is a recorded I'm session. Incorrect. Okay. Taking consent. Incorrect. Yes. I will... Um, Sorry, somebody's asking a question. Ah, right. <laughs> Professor Dharmendra, taking consent from family via telephone for inpatient neurosurgical emergency at 2 a.m. Of course, a few things. Huh? First of all, if the patient is an adult of sound mind, I'm wondering, you know, in a neurosurgical emergency, is the patient of sound mind or unconscious? If the patient is unconscious and, of, and is an adult, go ahead even without consent. Asking family members is only, you know, maybe informing them. But a voice on the telephone, who is it? You won't know. I'm not very convinced about telephone, uh, say, consent. Okay, is it better to have a proper explanation of the procedure, its indication and risk given to the patient and documented it far rather than signing a standardized consent form, which is very general? Possibly. Well, I think that one, uh, we I will mean, go uh, for another I'm session. I'm really troubled uh, at seeing more and more detailed consent forms. It's all the bad advice of lawyers, you know. <laughs> you go to the lake club, right? You'll see at the entrance a very lengthy message, you know. Basically, you know what the lengthy message says? You park at your own risk. But, you know, it's in all very legal language that you, you know, uh, cannot sue the club, etc., you know, for any theft, damage, whatever. <laughs> Just a few words will do. You park at your own risk. By the way, I've seen a good ones in Australia where they give patient information leaflets. They explain in careful language after consulting experts in the English language and other languages, they consult lawyers, they consult doctors, and they come up with a patient information form. Very readable, very helpful. They don't put it into a consent form. The trouble with lawyers in this country is they like to think, you know, consent forms like the contract. Somebody asked another a question, is it? Yes, more and more. Okay. Is there a verbal consent contradicts to right. Is there verbal consent? If there is a verbal consent that contradicts to the written consent and nobody admits to it, <laughs> yeah. Just, Please, no, I think she's talking about my case just now that I gave an example. First of all, uh, I've already said, just because something in writing uh, exists, it doesn't mean that you cannot verbally also uh, withdraw that written consent. It's a matter of evidence. I think the problem with that case that I've just mentioned is that the patient died. So, the, so it's uh, confidential in the, in the cath lab. But if the patient didn't die, he could have sued. By the way, I'll put it this way. Huh? Judges have long recognized documentary evidence is not necessarily the truth. Oral evidence is still evidence. The judge has to come to a conclusion whether to accept the documentary evidence or the oral evidence. Also, the judge has to come to a conclusion. Huh? Did the patient withdraw the written consent orally later? And you have seen in your experience, I'm sure, you doctors, that there are cases where patients change their mind. 
And if the patient is changed, has changed his mind, taking the patient downstairs twice in a day, I'm appalled when the patient has refused. What are they thinking? Like lawyers say, this is a contractual bargain. You have signed for it. Therefore, we have to take you down a second time and shut up. <laughs> uh, is there another question? What if the woman, uh, contraception, ah, uh, yes. Actually, general principle, a woman has the right to decide for herself. Actually, consent from the husband is not necessary at common law. But I've been told that in certain religions, for instance, in Islam, that the consent of the husband too is necessary. Especially if it's a permanent procedure, you know, like say, tubal ligation. But then I wonder, you know, about Islamic authorities, so what do they say? Hmm? What if there's a sound medical reason for the woman to undergo a sterilization procedure? that one more pregnancy may kill her while she brings another life into the world. Well, that's a matter to be debated. What is this, uh, another one? What? Okay, we're going to take this last question and we're going to stop here. It's An emergency where consent cannot be obtained, is there a need for a minimum of two doctors? This is in the private healthcare law. It is nonsense. <laughs> it may be good practice, that's all. So in good faith, for the benefit of the patient, okay, we as gatekeepers, the doctors, will do our best. Well, ladies and gentlemen, my closing remarks will be, I am very, very frustrated. Oh, that I see things have gone wrong. I would like to move out of the field of medical law, maybe go into something like celebrity divorce, advising <laughs> the wives of billionaires, you know, how to show a high spending pattern without arousing the husband's suspicions. Okay? Hey, I thought you wanted to be a stand-up comedian. Okay, guys, uh, before we end here, okay, I just want to say that... Um, We'll probably ask uh, Mr. Ranjan to come back for another session. Uh, on what? We don't know. Maybe a stand-up comedy session. <laughs> He's been quite entertaining, I must say. Okay. And uh, we don't know yet. Um, anyway, my schedule is full until November. But I think we, we would like to listen to you again. Very much. And um, as many of us, Mr. Ranjan, um, as we are now switching, you may not know this, but a lot of the doctors have now switched from MPS to every other um, indemnity law uh, insurer. Uh, many of them are allowing us to choose our own panel of law, our own lawyers. To... So if ever, you may now defend doctors instead of patients? Uh, sorry, to this day, my firm does undertake defense of doctors and hospitals. You do? Oh, this yes, to this day. Sometimes we refuse, decide not to act for patients. Sometimes we decide not to act for doctors because we look at things like conflicts of interests. Mm -hmm. So we can't get involved in a certain case, say. I see. So like, uh, if the doctor concerned, say, is a friend of my family, or if the patient, you know, all right, uh, cannot come to my firm for certain reasons, then we won't act for that patient. But of course, Mr. Ranjan's firm is very famous for medical legal, but as he has mentioned, he's going to take up uh, more and more cases of celebrity divorces <laughs> and also defamation cases. <laughs> okay, I see you guys. Thank you, Mr. Ranjan. See Thank you. you. Mohan. Bye. 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 Thank you. It was very good. So I find it very, very enlightening. Thank you.
Bye.